The 1920s was called the Roaring Twenties for many reasons. Flappers, like we just watched in video 7-3, were one reason. But there's also changes in alcohol consumption. In fact, there was such a push to limit alcohol consumption in the 1920s that Congress passed the 18th Amendment, December 18, 1917. This prohibition amendment literally banned the right to own, consume, sell, consume, or own, I can't remember the exact wording, alcohol from all homes and businesses. This is also known as the Volstead Act. The Volstead Act was passed to enforce the 18th Amendment and went into effect 1920. Now this noble experimented, experiment prohibited the manufacture, sale, and distribution of alcoholic beverages. So consuming is not illegal. You just can't make it, you can't sell it, and you can't get it from somebody. Now, this noble experiment was supported by prohibitionists. They believed that alcohol was the root of all social problems in the United States at the time. Who was the typical prohibitionist? Female, Protestant, and living in rural areas. Now, the Prohibition Movement was led by two major groups, the Anti-Saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. In a sense, Prohibition probably worked. The overall consumption of alcoholic beverages dropped consistently up until the last years. So it was successful in limiting consumption. However, for the most part, prohibition failed drastically. Hardcore drinkers continued to drink. And they looked to organize crime to get their alcohol, which we're going to talk about. Prohibition was ended in 1933 with the ratification of the 21st Amendment. Now, many say, which we're not quite there yet, but it was... Prohibition was ended because 1933 were about three and a half years into the Great Depression and there was a decision by the government to allow people to produce alcohol to increase jobs as well as giving people something to help them deal with the Great Depression. So if you wanted to get alcohol in the 1920s, you could and probably you would have gone to a speakeasy. A speakeasy is a private secret nightclub where alcohol was sold illegally. The name comes from the fact that when you went to order a drink, you were to keep your voice down and to speak easy. In order to enter a speakeasy, one had to give the password to the doorman. A person had to know the right people to get the password. These speakeasies were so popular, how could they be a secret? Well, in reality, they weren't. Everyone knew that they existed, and everyone knew that alcohol was being served at them. If that was the case, how did they manage to stay open? Well, I want you to watch this little video clip for additional information on the speakeasy. No sooner was the law enacted than thousands of illegal bars began to sprout up, called speakeasies. These underground establishments were available only to patrons who knew the password. Speakeasies often occupied back rooms and basements of legitimate businesses and offered paying customers their choice of illegal drinks. So going back to that question, if everybody knew about a speakeasy, how did they stay around? Well, even... Even the authorities were involved in keeping alcohol flowing freely. Police officers were often paid to turn a blind eye to the goings-on at these nightclubs. Every major city in the U.S. had speakeasies. Perhaps the best known was the 21 Club in New York City. Procedures to hide liquor 
were so good at the 21 Club that throughout the 13 years of Prohibition, no liquor was ever found there. This video clip coming up captures the images and music that was common in speakeasies. But behind closed doors, alcohol still reigned in the world of the speakeasy. <laughs> In this underworld, the liquor flowed, immersed in decadence, absorbed with luxury. The fashions were daring, the dancing was liberated. Women could flaunt their sexuality. So, as I mentioned before, speakeasies and prohibition gave rise to organized crime. It had good intentions but the results were disastrous. The need for illegal liquor led to the rise of organized crime. Speakeasies needed liquor on a large scale, and the mob stepped up to provide it. New York City and Chicago became the two centers for mob activity. Speakeasies not only became a source of liquor for the drinkers, but also a center for gambling. Most of the liquor that was smuggled into the country came in through Detroit. A mob called the Purple Gang controlled the flow of liquor in and out of De Detroit. Other organized crime groups, gangs, were well established in the 1920s to provide illegal alcohol. Some of these you should recognize. For instance, Al Scarface Capone ran the largest of all organized crime gangs, an Italian gang based primarily in the south side of Chicago. By 1929, his total wealth was estimated to be more than $62 million. He gained so much political power that law enforcement officials could not control him any longer. He was both a good guy and a bad guy. Both a good guy and a bad guy. He donated a lot of money to various charities and organizations. But in the end, he was still violating the law. As Capone gained power, he went after his largest rival, George Bugs Moran, who ran an Irish-German-based gang on the north side of Chicago. So you can see they're dueling for territory in Chicago. To get rid of his rival, Capone set a trap for Moran with the help of the Purple Gang. Moran and members of his gang were lured into a garage to buy liquor when members of Capone's gang dressed as police officers raided the place. Luckily for Moran, he arrived late and never made it inside. Seven members of Moran's gang were lined up by the policemen and shot in the back with machine guns. The event occurred on February 14, 1929 and became known as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. The massacre effectively put an end to Moran's power in organized crime. Unable to pin any type of murder charges on Capone, eventually the police arrested him for violation of the Volstead Act and tax evasion in 1931. He was convicted and served an 11 year sentence. Now the mystique of the good guys and the bad guys was never so strong and clear as it was during the 1920s mob years. The untouchables, were a group of FBI agents assigned to the task of bringing an end to mob activity in Chicago and more specifically an end to Al Capone. They were led by Agent Elliot Ness. The group was given the name Untouchable because they were said to be above reproach and untouchable by the mob. Ness con 
conducted a successful string of raids on Capone's breweries, the work of Ness and his untouchables finally sent Capone to prison.